I'm a ceramic engineering professor and I teach ceramic engineering. And about, oh, I don't know, 15 years ago or so, John Gill approached me and said, I think you should teach glaze calc. And what I didn't really understand at the time that that was the first step in several, well, 15 years of manipulation by John in terms of interaction with the artist. And in fact, we gave a Bergman forum um, a couple of years ago that was about the intersection of art and engineering. And uh, John and I actually were at a conference in London prior to that. And our title was The Placemat, the, Interaction, or the Intersection of Art and Engineering and Art and Science. Because John and I frequently have lunch together and we draw out ideas on the placemat because it makes it more accessible to him and it makes me think about it in a different way. So color in ceramic glazes is, um, uh, I had an invitation by Susan Kowalczyk to give a talk in connection with the Colorscape uh, exhibit that was at the Shine Joseph Museum this past fall. And um, Kayla Stein had curated the, uh, the, the exhibit and it was white and green and brown, basically. And my interest is more in green, but uh, I talked a little bit about white and also about brown. And this is sort of a variation on that talk. And I've pruned some things out and I've changed some things to make them hopefully a little more accessible. Uh, these pieces, the one on the, on the left here is, uh, is essential. These are all considered celadons. And celadons are uh, essentially an ancient uh, green colored ceramic glaze. And the way that it was developed, I think, um, people have correctly identified that celadons were obtained from iron. But how that iron got into that glaze, I think, was a bit of a question. And uh, I have some examples down here of different colors because I'm going to talk about color as sort of an introduction. And then we'll talk about celadons because the celadon part of this is really interesting. So to start off, I think it's really safe to say, and it's important for you to realize, that I don't really understand color. <clears throat> now, that's um, it's not meant to, meant to be sort of uh, self-denigrating or something. Uh, I am partially colorblind, so that means I have an excuse. <clears throat> and, and what that means, though, also is that the other day my sons um, uh, are 15 and 12, and any time that this comes up in our house, uh, my younger son in particular will point to something and say, what color is this? And um, that is a challenge, right? So uh, corporal punishment being out of the way and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> anyway, so the issue with color, though, is that when, when I teach ceramic science to artists and I teach glaze calc to artists, uh, they're always much more interested in the color typically than in, in glazes and texture and chemistry. But you can't get to one without the other. But if they have specific questions about color, I say, go talk to John because John has an encyclopedic knowledge of color and how you get a certain color. But in discussions over lunch the other day about this exact comment, I don't understand color, John said, well, in fact, no one really understands color. So if, if you brought in a Pantone color for a printer, they can match that exactly. If you bring in a Pantone color to a ceramic artist, there it's unlikely, or even to a scientist, to go, I can get that color exactly in a, in a glaze, for example. And the issues are that glazes in particular are more difficult than, say, glasses. So I've been doing some work lately with Cop Glass, which is in Pittsburgh. They make colored glasses. And down here, I have a bunch of these examples, and I don't think that I can uh, um, pass them around easily. But that blue dome is a color that Cop Glass makes. They make lighting, for example, for airport runways and for uh, the lights on the backs of planes and the wings and things like that. <coughs> and they're very specific. So they have an exact uh, color match to that color, uh, and it has to meet an, FDA, an FF, FAA excuse me, requirement. But that color that you see in that um, dome is dictated by thickness. So that means that the, the disc standing next to that is, um, which you, you can hardly see, but it looks blue, but actually for them that's a green because when they make that thin, it is green to us, not blue. And so there's a lot of complications associated with that. And next to that blue is an electrical insulator, that dome-shaped piece next to it. And there's a piece of glass that came out of a glass tank, which is light green. And that light green is because of iron. But glazes on the thickness, on a ceramic body, are exceptionally thin, if you will. In fact, normal glass would not hold up at that thickness, except perhaps on your flat panel display now. And the consequence is that 
This is the uh, typical uh, body glaze cross section, just a fracture surface. This is the body up to here, and then this is the glaze. And the thickness of that glaze is small. Uh, throughout the talk, you're going to see these little yellow circles, and I tried to make them all yellow because I thought that would be easy to identify them. And they represent, for each image that shows up, the diameter of a human hair. So you have a context for how you see this image. Because we, in, in engineering, you look at the size bar, which is down here. It says 100 microns. You go, okay, I get that. But typically, if you're not used to looking at that, you have to have some reference. So it's remarkably uh, uniform, the thickness of hair. My hair, as small amount as there is, your hair, anybody's hair, basically is about 60 microns in thickness. So what you see is that the glaze thickness is less than three diameters of a hair. Okay? That very thin layer of glass means that in order to get color out of this glaze, I have to have typically a lot of color uh, present. And the other thing is that unlike this dome down here that you see, which you see color in transmission, meaning that the light passes through that dome, in the glaze it does pass through, but then it essentially reflects, the light passes through, reflects off the body and comes back. So you're really seeing that color and reflection, and that's very different. And so the consequence is that uh, color levels tend to be very, very high. And the other thing is that we have different ways of getting, to co getting color, and I'm going to talk about that, but um, this color that shows up in the glaze can be very sensitive to the atmosphere in the kiln. What that means is, is my kiln oxidizing, meaning, meaning it has excess oxygen, or is it reducing, meaning that it is deficient in oxygen and therefore scavenging or stealing oxygen out of uh, the glaze. And when it does that, you get reduction, and that reduction changes the color. And so one example of that is, uh, and this is why it's so complicated, if I have um, copper or, or iron in a uh, glaze that contains sodium, I believe I get uh, a green. And if I have it in a glaze that contains potassium, I get a blue. Okay? And that subtlety, frankly, I get the color part, and I can see that, by the way. Um, that subtlety is complicated. Okay, so <coughs> to sort of set the stage and, and to give myself an out in case there's any really difficult questions, there are 15 mechanisms for color in glass. And if you're really interested in this, there's a great book by a guy named Nassau. It's called The Physics and Chemistry of Color. And he goes into this in great detail. Um, but essentially, in ceramics and in glazes, there are three ways, not mechanisms, but ways for us to get color. And they steal from these different mechanisms. And one is solution colors, and that's metal oxides. So that means that I bring in a uh, chemistry that reacts with the glaze to give me color. That's by far the most complicated. Um, and that's also, by the way, the subtitle, which is color is the happy accident. That's a tr uh, translation from, from Chinese. When I was in China, they talked about, oh, this was a happy accident, meaning something that happened that they didn't plan on, but they liked the result. And that's how color has more or less evolved over the ages. Um, so solution colors, metal oxides, are by far the most complicated and, and if you will, difficult. Stains are insoluble pigments, crystalline pigments. Uh, they're very, very similar to what you might see in wall paint. Right? So if you uh, bring in a uh, color that you like to, say, the hardware store, they can mix up a paint for you. Because they're using, at that point, uh, colors that are not going to change, really, outside of that drying process. And then we have inclusion pigments, which are pigments that were invented about 20 years ago that eliminate all of the interactions with the glaze and make it really simple. I call these last two cheating, actually, um, because, <coughs> and it's sort of a, a joke, but if you put a yellow stain like this yellow plate up here, this is a zircon vanadium yellow. If you put in a yellow stain and you get yellow out and you're surprised, then you're really not paying attention to what's going on, right? So, so the zircon stains are, are generally the, stole, uh, the most common, as we call them, mason stains, and there are several other companies, but um, by and large, people refer to them as mason stains like people refer to Kleenex, okay? And there's usually what are called spinel-based or zircon-based. And what that means is that they are based on a crystal that really does not like to dissolve into that glass structure of the glaze. So uh, zircon is really well known to be insoluble in a glaze and in a glass. And so what you do is you add material to that zircon lattice to get a color, and you put that into a glaze. 
and zircon laughs at the glaze and comes back the same color that it started. It doesn't dissolve very readily. And so uh, what they can do is um, they basically don't care about the kiln atmosphere. They put it in, and the intensity of that color is based on how much you put in, and it's independent of firing conditions typically. And like I said, if you put in yellow, you get out yellow. Right. Um, this is an a, a electron micrograph. Here's your uh, hair diameter at the bottom. These little pigment particles basically are, are zircons, and they get um, mixed up into the glaze, and then they sit in the glaze, and they scatter light or absorb light the way that you would like them to. So um, there was a great praseodymium yellow years ago, and I like it just for the name. And then we get into inclusion pigments. So I've jumped right out of zircons because, frankly, I don't find them very interesting. And um, inclusion pigments came about about 20 years ago, and they allow us to get bright reds and uh, oranges now and things like that. And down here I have two oranges, and I really encourage you to come up and look at them. The one on the top, the bowl, uh, that orange was obtained not by an inclusion pigment because that bowl was made in the 1940s. That bowl uses uranium to get that orange. And it's this really great pumpkin orange. Um, of course, there are some issues with that, you understand. But <coughs> uh, the one underneath is an inclusion pigment, and the quality is just not nearly as nice. Uh, cadmium, for example, is important for uh, reds in particular, and, and the uh, cadmium particles are embedded basically in a zircon matrix so that when you put it into the glaze, the cadmium sticks around, the zircon doesn't dissolve, and you end up with that pigment particle. But it's different, and it's different in the way that they create that. So <coughs> they encapsulate these cadmium particles in this zircon uh, shell, if you will. And the consequence of that is that those inclusion pigments are remarkably expensive. But our desire to get color and to get that bright red overrides our economic considerations. Okay, this is an example. This, um, there's little shards down here that came off of a Homer Laughlin uh, plate. They do fiesta wear, and, and uh, my students worked there uh, one summer, and they brought back this plate that had this fascinating failure. And um, so I took a chunk and looked at it in cross-section. This is the glaze here, so this is the body. And these white spots that you see are actually the pigment. And if you look at it at high magnification, now this is a hair diameter, and you can see this little particle. And the little things that light up in here are actually the cadmium uh, grains. So, you know, again, I mean, this is 8 to 10 percent uh, pigment, cadmium encased in zircon. You put in red, you get out red. Um, we can't really do this without talking about white. And uh, we were walking uh, through art and design one day, and Freddie Fredrickson, I heard, overheard him said, uh, say, it's like artists discussing brown. And it's the same thing with art, with white. I mean, if you, uh, you can look at, uh, I have zirconia buttons, uh, zircon, zirconia buttons on my shirt, and they're absolutely white. It's really hard to find ceramic buttons anymore. Um, <coughs> and uh, I have some white examples down here, and there are different levels of white. And what we see typically is that uh, most of that whiteness is due to scattering. And so we have uh, opacifiers that we put in in order to make that surface whiter. And these three opacifiers, zircon, titanium, tin oxide. Titanium and tin were used before World War II, and then tin became a strategic material. And tin was no longer available for, as an opacifier, so zircon came in. And people like zircon better because it gives a blue-white, whereas tin uh, is more of a gray-white, I think, and titanium is more of a yellow-white. Here we are. We're discussing white, right? And <coughs> uh, in clays, we have domestic clays in the United States and clays that are imported. Almost all the domestic clays in the United States have impurities in them, and everyone immediately keys on iron as the problem, but it's not iron, actually. It's actually titania. So what you find is that the level of titania as an impurity in these clays scales with the level of whiteness. Lower titania means better white. And it, it is iron, but it's not iron uh, as it's measured. It's iron that substitutes in that titania lattice. So when you look at the raw material chemistry, and people who do traditional ceramics look at it and go, ah, that's, that's not going to be white. That's going to be off-white. So there's a mug down here uh, that's it's clearly not white, but it, we would call it white. And it's a domestic clay, uh, Buffalo China, actually, from years ago. And next to that is a bowl from Sri Lanka that had a very clean, low titania clay. 
So uh, basically, if I opacify that white, meaning I put in scattering sites, I get something like this white over here, an opacify white glaze. Uh, this is zircon addition, and you get these little particles, and these particles scatter light, and when they scatter light, you get white. And you can add pigments to that, and it will change that pigment response, but essentially you're scattering light. If you uh, put in zirconia instead of zircon, you get these little needles, and this, for these two images, that's a hair. And up here, here's a lower uh, magnification. You see that the distribution of the zircon, and you can't see it to the naked eye, but it gives you this bright white. But the consequence of that is a surface roughness and I have an example down here. This plate over here is terribly metal marked, and metal marking is a consequence of that surface roughness. So when you uh, cut with your knife, you leave little bits of, uh, of metal behind. That's these bright images here. And so what you have is um, as you use that plate, it metal marks. Now, <coughs> what that is is that that surface roughness creates friction increases the friction between the knife and the surface of the glaze and you actually damage the glaze. So <coughs> we had a project on reducing metal marking years ago and uh, I was talking to this uh, old gentleman from Spain and he said, oh well I have a solution, you should lower the seat. And I said, what do you mean you should lower the seat? And he says, people can get less leverage on the knife then. Um, and then the other part of that is uh, a friend of mine worked in a, a company in Ohio making dinnerware and he said, I have two plates, the same production run, going to two different restaurants. One metal marks, one doesn't. You know, what's going on or what do you think? And I asked him if where it metal marks, is it a healthier restaurant, you know, salads, things like that, versus a greasy spoon, you know, uh, meat and potatoes. He said, I don't know. He said, I'll check. He said, water dramatically increases that coefficient of friction and increases the tendency of plates to metal mark and damage. So <coughs> it's up to you at this point. Other whites. Um, uh, this is uh, this this uh, is down here. The, this uh, cup. Rob Sutherland took a glaze that uh, we developed in our labs years ago. It's a, a glaze that crawls intentionally. And while we developed that glaze, Rob made it famous. And he did a bunch of uh, pieces. And, and and this is this really great white, but also the way the glaze texture behaves. Um, this down here, the hands. We call them the hands of the um, Hall China makes uh, glove forms and they go to make latex gloves actually and the texture that's on the outside of the gloves is on the outside of the mold when they take the glove off they invert it right and um, and then you would argue in the absence of anything else that this is white but in fact um, it's pretty far from white and then this is one of my favorite vases it's the ding uh, a dingware glaze from the song dynasty it's in the personal david collection so we have all these other whites but I don't really want to talk much more about whites. I want to talk about Korean celadons, and I want to talk about celadons in general. So <coughs> Korean celadons, um, I think they were the first culture to develop this green glaze, and it was in the Koryo period of, uh, of Korea, which is around the, the uh, 10th to 12th century, basically. And uh, this is a, a Koryo period tea bowl. Actually, it's really a beautiful piece. It has a crack and they inlaid the crack with bronze or or something to repair that crack so they valued the piece enough to repair it. Uh, this is a more modern vase but the reason that I show you this is because if you look at this inlay region you have two different types of inlays. You have a white inlay and you have a dark inlay. So the way the piece is made is it's typically a red body meaning it contains iron and then they'll carve on that body when it's green and then they'll They'll put in either a white slip to produce the white or they'll put in iron oxide to produce the black lines. And then they clean all that up and then they glaze it and they fire it at one time. Okay. Now, the reason I'm showing you this is because this, the white patches here are really important because what the white patches indicate is that that glaze did not contain iron when it was put on. The glaze is actually a clear glaze. You could say it's a white glaze, but that would... Uh, be incorrect. It's actually a clear glaze. And so this clear glaze, when it's put on, it contains no iron. And so the green that develops here is entirely because of the interaction of that glaze with the body. And so where there is white, there's no interaction. There, where there is a lot of interaction, but there's no iron. And where it's on the red body or on the iron-containing body, it actually dissolves iron and pulls it into the glaze and creates this green. So <coughs> we have this 12th century bowl and uh, um, uh, Chorwon Kim, I think was his name. He, I don't know, 
how he got a hold of this bowl, <coughs> but uh, he brought it and he wanted to study his Korean Celadons and we were very interested. We said, sure. And um, he says, okay, I, I want to section this bowl to uh, look at the glaze. And I'm like, uh, no, I'm not going to cut up a 12th century bowl um, in order to do this analysis. So he says, no, no, it's okay. The, you know, the government of Korea says it's fine for me to do this. I said, I'm not. You know, I absolutely refuse to do this. So we compromised. And what you can see is that in the middle of this bowl is a half inch hole. We core drilled the center of the bowl so that we could get our samples out for analysis. Okay, so where this started was our original interest, uh, and it comes from uh, the work we've been doing in traditional ceramics and whitewares and porcelains, is that we wanted to determine the firing temperatures of, of Korean celadon. So in 2005, I was in Korea, and we we're walking through the Chosun Museum, and uh, one of the um, uh, uh, one of my guides said, "Oh, we just got a project to determine firing temperature." <laughs> My tachometer, as John said, my tachometer was on. I go, oh, we can do that. You know, so uh, what it is is that we have done a lot of other work, and what we figured out is that the chemistry of the body and the chemistry specifically of the glass in the body is not random at all. It's very regular, and that that chemistry scales remarkably linearly with temperature. So if we looked at the chemistry of the glass that forms in the body, we can back out the temperature temperature to within 10 degrees, which is cool, okay? So <coughs> um, so he, we started working with them, but then Cho Wan brought this piece in. So we first, uh, prior to funding, we, we took a look at this T-bowl uh, from Corio, And we were also at the same time doing other work to look at the way that glazes and bodies interact. And so from the T-bowl, we looked at the, the mineralogy and the chemistry of that body. We determined a firing temperature. And then we looked at the body glaze interaction. And to give you a context for that, in modern firing, so everything up here, there's, a, there's uh, one piece that's actually ancient. Everything else is modern. And all of these other pieces, the body glaze interaction is about the diameter of a hair. So that means I put a glaze on a body, and I fire it up. The glaze will dissolve about 60 microns of body. Okay? So that's good. So we took this. Um, uh, Corio bowl, and we sectioned it. Now, what these are are chemistry scans. So this is silicon, this is aluminum, this is calcium, and this is iron. We did some others as well. We have really, really great toys in engineering. Okay, <coughs> and so this, um, these cross sections tell us chemistries. We're able to map that chemistry. So there's a lot of stuff up here. So I'm going to walk through it. Okay. So aluminum is first. So what you get is over here, increasing concentration, I get um, higher reds. Uh, as I go more red or, or yellow or orange, I'm higher in concentration, and blue means low concentration. So over here, this is silicon. So I, I don't look for oxygen because there's oxygen everywhere, and I get silicon. So these particles are quartz down in the body. And then here, uh, this is the glaze, actually. So this little corner is really hard to see, but it's not quite flat, and that's actually the exterior surface of the glaze. And then what I have in here, I have these inclusions of silica in here, but also when I look at the next one, this is aluminum, this inclusion of aluminum and this inclusion of silica tell me that this is mullite. Okay? Now I tell uh, my students uh, that, you know, you know how it is, right? Uh, as a student, you're, you go to the bar and sooner or later you're talking about mullite. You know, you'd be surprised. My record is like 30 seconds after walking in the bar. I'm talking about molite. But the issue here is that molite cannot form in the glaze. Okay? Um, it's not possible. Molite forms in the body but cannot form in the glaze because the chemistry of the glaze is such that molite will simply not form. So what that means is in order for us to find molite in the glaze, that means that what they did when they made that body is they crushed up old body and incorporated it into new body. So they had body that was already fired that contained molite. They put it in new body, <coughs> so they're recycling in the 12th century, and then they made the piece. So you have little pieces of molite in the body. What happens is that, uh, there's a couple other things here, but this is the body now down here, and this is the glaze. And so we know that because of calcium. So there's no calcium in the body. Calcium is only in the glaze. So the calcium starts up here, and then it slowly dissolves body 
and penetrates into the body. So this is the depth of penetration of, of calcium. This is actually the thickness of my glaze. So the way to find out where they started, so what you have is you have a body and you apply glaze to it and then it gets fired. You have to be able to go back and in order to figure out how the body and glaze are interacting, you have to figure out where you started. And so these inclusions of molite tell us where we started and we started up here. And this is the interaction of the body with the glaze. And this is the glaze application thickness. Now what's interesting from another perspective is that glaze application thickness is almost identical to glaze application thicknesses today. So the Koreans in the 12th century weren't applying really thick glazes. They were actually applying relatively thin glazes much like we do. But we have a small problem because <coughs> this is roughly 200 microns of penetration depth. Here's the hair, right? There's a 100 micron size bar. This is 200 microns of penetration depth. I'm less than three diameters of a, of a, a, a hair here. And normally I expect to see about this much penetration and I'm seeing all of this. Something is not quite correct, right? So um, by comparison, okay, so grog serves as a marker, but as comparison, this would be my normal glaze thickness in a modern body, okay? So what that means is that these Korean celadons and the quality of these glazes is a function of several things, and one is how thick that glaze actually is on the piece, and the thicker glaze gives us different interaction of light, and so we like that. So the question, though, is our model says 60 micron penetration, and I've got 200 micron penetration. How do I rectify that? So <coughs> what we found is, just sort of summary briefly, body glaze interactions are extensive, right? And that means that th the other issue of this is that people typically will go in and they'll chip off a uh, sample of the glaze. And uh, if they have the facilities, which are rare, they'll analyze it or they'll send it out to somebody else and they'll analyze the chemistry of the glaze and they'll come back and they go, oh, I have the chemistry of the glaze, I can come up with a batch. So then they'll batch that glaze and they'll apply that glaze to a piece and they'll fire it and lo and behold, it doesn't look the same. In fact, sometimes it doesn't look anything like the glaze that's on the piece that you started with because that interaction of the body and the glaze results in a significant shift in chemistry of that glaze by dissolving the body. We see a big change in the chemistry of that glaze from what was applied to what's done after firing. Okay, And this Coriol bowl gave me 200 micron penetration depth and what that meant was that our current model was incorrect. We had never seen penetration depths of that uh, thickness. So we started working with KeySet. KeySet is the Korean Institute of Ceramic Engineering and Technology. They're based in Seoul and we started working with them on the analysis of ancient shards but first, we had to correct our model. So <coughs> I told you a little bit about WDS, Wavelength Dispersive Spectroscopy. There's going to be a quiz after this, in case you were wondering. And um, this is a really great tool because it allows me or provides me with a chemistry map. So I can go in and I can scan these pieces and I can tell the distribution of silica and the distribution of alumina and the distribution of calcium, for example. And then by comparing these maps, we can identify where the chemistries uh, are located and how they shift. And when I mentioned before, there's no calcium in the body. So calcium is a really great thing to check for because I can, uh, it's uh, unique and not in the body. I can scan for calcium and see where the calcium is. And that tells me a lot about how the body and glaze interact. But we have to have this original body glaze interface. So this is a calcium map for a commercial glaze actually. Um, so uh, what we have basically is uh, Dave Finklenberg was a, a master student of mine years ago and we have a, a, we've done a lot of work on glazing and he basically, this is a, a map for silicon and these particles are quartz and you see this region, there's these little, this line is drawn on here obviously, but these little inclusions are actually aluminum oxide. So this was a commercial body, contained alumina, the alumina doesn't dissolve into the glaze, served as our marker, okay. So what we figured out is that this is the penetration of calcium into the glaze and you can see that it's not that far off from our average 60 microns, okay? You can also see in this image there's no calcium in the body, there is only calcium in the glaze and you can see exactly how far that uh, penetrated. So <coughs> we wanted to figure out if there was something else going on. So 
Tom Rain was a, a bachelor's thesis student of mine, and we did a bunch of experiments, and we used zircon as a marker. Now, you can put zircon in the glaze, like an opacifier, or you can put zircon in the body. And we thought it would be better to put zircon in the body. So here's a map of zircon. So this is essentially a body glaze. So this is the body and this is the glaze. And what you see here is you see all the little spots. That's zircon. These open spaces are where we have probably quartz grains or mullite or something. And then no zircon in the glaze. And then if I look at a map of calcium, I have my original body glaze interface. These are the same scan. And I can see how far calcium has penetrated into the body. So what Tom did was that he basically, um, a whole bunch of stuff I don't need, he uh, looked at a whole series of samples fired for different times. And um, we did it on a log scale. So this is one hour. So he did one, two, four, eight, 16, 32, 64 hours in the kiln. 1300 degrees C. Um, so we plotted. He looked at his penetration depth as a function of time. And what you see is, we have log of penetration depth. And what that means is this is 10 microns, there's 100 microns, there's 1,000 microns or one millimeter, and then this is my time, one hour, 10 hours, 100 hours. One week sits out here. So that's one week at temperature. So I would take it up to uh, temperature, uh, go on vacation, come back, take my sample out. Right? So what Tom find, found was that this relationship, there's a lot of data points indicating that it's a log-log relationship. So from that, I can figure out how long would I have to hold a sample to get 200 microns of penetration depth. This is my 200 micron line. I have to hold that sample almost 100 hours to get 200 micron penetration depth. So time temperature results. We looked at, uh, uh, these are sort of the, this is the punchline, and I'll tell you how we got there in a moment. Uh, this 12th century bowl was at 1180 degrees C for four days at temperature. So typical firings today are at temperature for three hours, if you're talking about porcelains or dinnerware, or sanitary ware, or whatever. Um, if you're talking about tile, that time is about uh, six to 10 minutes. They're very, very fast cycles. But modern firings, typically for large ware, dinnerware, electrical insulators, or whatever, uh, is about um, three hours. So in Korea in the 12th century, wood-fired kilns, okay, uh, similar to the wood-fired kiln in art and design, pieces go in and they continue to fire for four days, get it up to temperature and continue to feed in wood basically for four days. Um, <coughs> two of other samples, Gunjin, uh, three days at 1210, and then uh, Gimje is four days at 1050. I think this uh, event here in, in Gimje was disappointing. And then disappointed because at 1050 is not hot enough. So it indicates that while we could see that they were at that temperature for a long period of time, they weren't at enough temperature. And the consequence is this piece is underfired. Okay, and that actually indicates um, sort of the problem that we're faced with. One of the problems is if I want to look at ancient shards, this can be really tricky because <coughs> uh, outside of the Korean government graciously giving us really perfect museum pieces to cut up into little pieces. Right, we have a, a bit of a problem, and that problem is you can go to a kiln site, and uh, I was in a, a famous kiln site in Korea, and I couldn't tell you where it was, but Hyojin probably can. And um, the discussion in the museum was all in Korean, and my Korean, I can order beer in Korea, and that's the extent of my knowledge of Korean. But basically, um, you know, this wasn't working. But then I thought about it, you know, we're on a kiln site, so. Um, I went out to the parking lot that had been bulldozed, and I went to the edge of the parking lot, and there's porcelain, uh, you know, whiteware shards all over the place. So I collected a bunch to bring back to take a look at. But you need to recognize that things that end up in the landfill at the kiln site are things that are inferior in some fashion. Now, if you're lucky, they're inferior because there was a defect. If you're unlucky, they're inferior because they were underfired or overfired, you see. So if we're trying to map firing behavior, it's a bit tricky to pull shards. And only perfect wear, right, can go on to the emperor. So if you have imperfect wear, you can't take it home and use it, okay, because that was actually a capital offense. So it would be sort of an issue, right, to have imperial china on your table, okay. 
Um, so the problem is that we really don't know. So what we we do know is that since there are shards at the kiln site, they were discarded for one reason or another. But they give us an idea, and we can start to look at that overall process. Okay. Oh, and the way they destroy them is they just break them, right? And that eliminates uh, the potential for someone to take them home, and you know, and it ends up in the landfill. So uh, the shard from uh, Gamjai, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, but uh, when we look at it, we see penetration depth of about 100 microns. And, and this uh, sample, so here's my aluminum. There's a crack here, obviously, but you can see uh, this was the glaze and this is the body. There's my uh, molite showing up at that interface. And here's my penetration depth, about 100 microns. Uh, in another case, um, uh, my average penetration depth is about 170 microns. And, and you can again see these uh, inclusions in there uh, and the glaze up above. And then uh, this is the one that we already looked at. So when I put all of that together, basically, um, what we see is that the chemistry of that glaze shifts dramatically with that firing cycle. So if, if you think about it from a really simple standpoint, if I put on 100 microns of glaze and I have 100 microns of penetration depth, then my new glaze chemistry is going to be half body. Right? So that means if I start here with the glaze as formulated, and here's my body, and I do a simple rule of mixtures, my final glaze ends up here. Right? So there's a, and this map, by the way, this is silica up here, and if I go down, I have aluminum over here, and I have my flux. So this is a phase diagram, and we can talk about that later if you'd like. Let me go back to that for a second. So recognize that if I started here, and if I chip this glaze off the body, and then I measure its chemistry and I create a new glaze, I'm going to end up over here, not the same chemistry at all. Okay, so what we did then to try to map these samples is we fired at different temperatures for long periods of time. So uh, we're getting smarter at this, but basically uh, 1200, 1250, and 1300, and they were fired. This is uh, one hour down here, so this is two hours, four hours, and this is... Um, somewhere around 12, I think. This is not four, it's about six. So what we see is, as I increase my firing time, I actually am changing the glass chemistry in the body. So what that means is if I take the body and analyze it, my assumption was three hours, which turns out to be incorrect. And what I can do then is now I can correct that. So the way we get around it for what we've already published and what we're working on is we refer to all of our temperatures as a three hour equivalent because nobody can argue with that, right? But notice the slopes of these. We can use this to determine then, we can iterate to determine how long they were at temperature when we combine that with the glaze penetration depth. So what I have here is this is 1200, this is 1250, and this is 1300. So as I go up in temperature, I actually change the way the body and glaze interact. It actually slows down as I go to higher temperature, which is something that we didn't expect. But by putting these two pieces of information together, I can tell you not just what temperature they were at, but how long they were there. So what I have is, uh, these are my silica levels in the glass. This is my glaze penetration depth. And I come back and can tell you that this bar body was fired at 100 hours at 1180. Uh, this shard was for 70 hours, so that's roughly um, three days, right? So in the first case, we would argue for four days at 1180. The second case is three days at 1210. And this last one actually was for four days, but only at 1050, it didn't get hot enough. And when we looked at the shard, that was consistent with the shard. The shard was punky. And what that meant was that the shard basically wasn't very strong and tended to crumble. And that's consistent that this even though it was at temperature for a long time, it wasn't at high enough temperature. So we know that our target temperature, these are not that far apart. Only 30 degrees C is a pretty small interval. Okay? And these temperatures can easily be, easily be obtained using wood. So that's the other question you might ask. Okay. Um, <coughs> so basically, uh, this is the argument for the original glaze as applied. So based on the chemistry of the glaze that we measured, and the interaction with the body. We can back out what the original chemistry of that glaze was as it was applied to the body. Now, so what happens, or what would happen, is if I took that chemistry, made up a glaze, then applied it to a modern body, and fired it, but only fired it for three hours, I would not get the same body-glaze interaction. And I would end up also with a different glaze, even though I formulated my glaze properly. So that means I have to actually take into account 
modern firing cycles and temperatures, how much the body and the glaze interact, what my glaze chemistry needs to be on the final piece, then I can back out what the glaze would start as. So my final glaze chemistry, if I batched this glaze, would end up here. If I can correct that, then, um, and if I do this chemistry for modern firing, my modern chemistry would have to be done here. So I wouldn't want to go all the way down to this because I'm not going to get the same level of body glaze interaction. So I would actually move my glaze a little bit closer to the glaze that I chipped off the body for comparison. Okay. And then I would be able to fire and I should get an identical uh, glaze. So the question that we were trying to answer was why are celadons green? And why celadons green is are green is because the glaze is dissolving the body. And what is dissolving out of the body is iron. So my first trip to Korea, um, Hyojin, who's sitting back here, he, uh, he said, oh, true celadons are on a, a red or a brown body. That if you have a celadon that's on a white body, that's not a true celadon. And so what people do is they add iron into that glaze to get that celadon green. <coughs> but what happens in these glazes is that um, the body is actually dissolving. And with that dissolution, you're pulling iron into the glaze. What's interesting, though, is when that happened, the happens, the iron is changing. It's changing from a plus 3 oxidation state, which is Fe2O3, to a 2 plus oxidation state, which is FeO. You get green from FeO, and you get brown from Fe2O3 or, Fe, or 3 plus iron. So this Korean celadon bowl, actually, um, and the result is, the kiln atmosphere is reducing, I get green. If it's oxidizing, I get brown. So the differences in color are sensitive then to the firing conditions. But the color itself comes because the body and the glaze interact. And the longer I fire, what I'll find is that the difference in the color, I would get a deeper green with a longer firing because I'll dissolve more iron into that glaze. Now I can add iron, but I have to add iron in a way that's going to be accessible. So I can add iron to the glaze in order to get that um, color also. So comparison with modern ceramics, uh, I'm going to skip this. Okay. So what we have basically is we've mapped out what the new uh, body formulation or glaze formulation would need to be to be on this to fire at a modern equivalent of about 1250, which is cone six basically. So if you look at the comparison, my feldspar levels are roughly the same, but I have a lot more clay in the modern body the modern glaze because I'm dissolving a lot of aluminum and silicon from the body into that glaze. And if I'm not going to do that step, I have to artificially increase the alumina content in the glaze. Um, my whiting is calcium and I have more whiting in the, in the Korean celadon, but I can get away with less here because I'm going to, uh, I'm not going to be pulling any out, but it works out. And then the flint, I have to have a lot more silica in that glaze to get a similar texture. Now, the thing we haven't done is to duplicate this, and, and then it occurred to me that there is another way. We need a very thick glaze to duplicate the Korean celadon, so they are roughly three times thicker than what we would do in a modern ceramic, and the way we get around that is that what, what I think we're going to try to do is incorporate some mullite as scattering sites in a first layer of glaze, and then apply a second layer of glaze on top of that and fire it all at one time. So we end up with a very thick application and a thick glaze, but with scattering sites to mimic. So, um, I think my timing's good. Uh, one one. Yeah. So, um, the thing is that the way the body and the glaze interact significantly alters the chemistry of that glaze. So when you chip the glaze off a body and uh, you look at it to figure out um, what the chemistry will be, it, you're going to miss because you're going to ignore the way that body and glaze interacts. And if we can compensate for the body glaze interactions, we're going to come up with a different glaze batch, and that glaze batch will allow us to then reproduce that glaze re uh, reliably. And knowing this, how much the body and glaze interacts, is a critical step to being able to duplicate ancient glazes. So um, for acknowledgments, I would like to acknowledge the Korean Institute of Ceramic Engineering Technology for funding. And um Soo Kim was a PhD student of mine from 2005 who now works there. Uh, Hyo Jin Lee, he's sitting back here. Um, he's unbelievably good. Uh, Jerry did a lot of electron microscopy, and then I have uh, Dave and Tom's thesis and uh, Choron Kim. So I'm happy to answer any questions. You're welcome to come up and take a look at these samples that are here.
questions? Yes. Um, there were at least, well, f the first pass is to look at it. I mean, that sounds rather silly, but people who are really good at it can tell. But in China, they would make rings of clay, and they would reach in with a, uh, a rod, basically, and they would pull.